I'm privileged this afternoon to moderate a conversation about the business community's perspective on the importance of access to justice during the pandemic. All four of our panelists are really leaders in business, law, civic engagement, philanthropy, and access to justice. I could uh, spend our 45 minutes uh, telling you about them uh, in the interest of hearing from them rather than from me. I'll just share uh, only a few of their extraordinary contributions. Uh, Teresa Wynn Roseboro serves as the Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Corporate Secretary at the Home Depot. Teresa leads uh, Home Depot's philanthropic activities, including the Home Depot Foundation. Teresa's civic involvement includes serving as a public member of the Administrative Conference of the United States, co-chair of the Board of Directors of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, and as a member of the Board of Overseers of the Rand Corporation Institute for Civic, Civil Justice. John Schultz is Executive Vice President and Chief Operating and legal officer for Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, I'm only gonna highlight one of John's many contributions to the legal and business field because it's a favorite of mine. He is the chair of the National Legal Aid and Defender Association's Corporate Advisory Council. And in that position, John annually leads the effort to garner uh, the support of general counsel from over 200 leading American businesses in a letter to Congress advocating for robust funding for the Legal Services Corporation. I think Congress expects to hear from John Levy and me. They're a little bit more surprised when John Schultz and 200 other business executives and lawyers uh, show up advocating for LSE and it's tremendously impactful. Um, David Rubenstein, greetings. Thanks for joining us. David is a co-founder and co-chair of the Carlisle Group. David is a leader in numerous cultural, patriotic, and economic philanthropic endeavors. Uh, if I just read all of his chairmanships alone, we'd be here for at least another 45 minutes. So I'll only talk about one area of his work, his uh, patriotic philanthropy. David has made transformative gifts for the restoration or repair of the Washington Monument, Monticello, the archives, the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, and the creation of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And uh, last and not least, Ken Frazier. Ken has served as the chair of the board and CEO of Merck since 2011. His contributions in the legal, business, and humanitarian fields, including the formation of philanthropic initiatives, have been widely recognized. Again, I'm going to highlight just one of Ken's activities, a uh, personal favorite of mine. Ken co-chairs uh, the Leaders Council at the Legal Services Corporation. And uh, this is not a ceremonial post. I've seen Ken put his schedule his day job scheduled to one side to work on LSC uh, advocacy. And I can testify that he devotes substantial thought, effort, and time to that work, and that his advocacy, as you will, would imagine, is highly effective. So thanks to all four of you. And uh, let me, for starters, ask this. Um, you're involved in a myriad of activities you have time-consuming and important uh, day jobs. In many cases, you wear many hats, yet you're here. And not just for the first time, but for, uh, in, in all instances, uh, you've, you've joined us many times and you are really champions uh, for access to justice. And the, really the question is why? You know, why, why uh, in your role as business leaders of companies and in representing yourself, do you focus on access to justice? Um, Ken, let me start with you. Let me start by saying how pleased I am to be on a panel with uh, John Schultz and Teresa Roseboro and David Rubenstein. I hope to hold up my end. So to answer your question, um, 
I think the simple fact of the matter is corporations are part of the broader fabric of society. Uh, we sit, swim in the same seas as everybody else right now. Unfortunately, uh, in our society, those seas are increasingly toxic in terms of the political discourse in our society. And so we have a strong interest, I think, in the healthy functioning of, a, of our democracy. Uh, as a lawyer, it obviously it matters to me because as a lawyer, I feel responsible as my colleagues do for the administration of justice. And in that regard, equal access to justice is fundamental to that. Uh, but as a CEO of Merck, it's important to me that, uh, that we create a world in which we have a stable democratic society um, and that really implies the rule of law, respect for the independent judiciary, et cetera. And equal access is, is a part of what we mean by the rule of law. So uh, I'll just end by saying, I think it's a mistake as corporations sometimes do in a, in a short-sighted way to think that if we get the benefit of the justice system, but if many of our fellow system, citizens don't feel the system is fair, if they don't believe that we have a well-functioning, fair and accessible legal system, then I think we're putting a lot at risk in the long term uh, because our businesses do require the stability uh, of our democracy in order to be successful, in order for us to make long-term investments. So, so that's why it matters to me. Thanks again. David, involved in a myriad of uh, well, causes, uh, why access to justice? Well, the simple answer is when John Levy asks you to do something, it's easier to say <laughs> yes at the beginning than just because you know, you're, you're venturing to get the yes. Uh, so you want to say yes at the beginning. But uh, to be very serious about it, um, our country is an experiment in democracy. Nothing like this had ever existed before. And while the founding fathers had wonderful rhetoric, uh, equal justice, so forth, everybody's going to be equal. The truth is for several hundred years, we haven't come close to that. One of the most important areas where we haven't come close to giving people equality is in the access to the justice system. Uh, in the constitution, it does say that if you are uh, can, uh, try or you're indicted in effect, you have right to counsel for a criminal uh, justice uh, kind of thing. Uh, in those days, when the constitution was being drafted, they didn't think about civil justice as being as important as it is today. We now know that most litigation occurs in the civil courts, not in criminal courts. And as a result, uh, I believe that the founding fathers were around today, they would say, well, they should, people should have the right to counsel in a civil uh, litigation, because we all know that if you don't have counsel in civil litigation, you have about a 90% chance of doing worse than those who have counsel. And so my view is I, I try to do various things to try to help us in a modest way, live up to the founding father's goals. And I think one of the most important areas where we failed is not giving people access to justice when they can't afford it in the civil system. Thanks, David. Teresa, why access to justice? Well, thank you so much, Ron, for inviting me to be here today and on this distinguished panel with uh, John and David and Ken. And Ken, if you feel any pressure, it's me hanging onto your coattails, uh, right. dragging you. Uh, down. And uh, just to add a little bit to what Ken and David said and agreeing completely with them about the structure of our democracy and what it requires for all of us and what the Home Depot as a corporation requires to be successful is the application of the rule of law and having that govern our relationships with vendors, suppliers, uh, customers, and associates. Um, on the more business side, you know, we have 6,000 business disputes a year end up in courts across America. And those courts have to function effectively for us, but also for our opponents and for the people who bring claims against us, some of whom are also businesses, but many of whom often are individuals. And if those individuals don't have quality representation, then the court system gets clogged and nobody has access uh, to it. And often, Disputes are resolved because of the structure of the courts leads to their resolution, their presence, and everyone's access to counsel allows everybody to step to the side of the formal judicial process and say, let's resolve this on our own, because we both have competent representation in order to facilitate the resolution of that dispute. On a more personal side, 
The Home Depot exists in part to support 500,000 careers. We have 500,000 associates who turn to us for their bread and butter, for their means of, of enriching their lives, for their means of supporting themselves uh, and their families and looking to us to provide a structure for their future, a way for them to grow uh, as they age through their lives to have increasing opportunities. And those associates need access to the judicial system in order to resolve disputes. I got a call or uh, email just yesterday from an associate who's a freight associate in one of our stores in Ohio. And if you know the life of a freight associate, this is a young uh, woman who helps unload our trucks in the back of a store, uh, typically on a night shift. Um, and she uh, shares an apartment with someone who works um, in a different uh, business, but works a day shift. So they're not often day together, but somehow they managed to have a dispute with each other about the payment of rent for the space and her roommate decided to sue her. And she reached out to me. She has no idea what a general counsel is, but someone told her that the company had lawyers. So she sent me an email and told me about her situation. And I was I had to tell her, you know, unfortunately, the legal department of the Home Depot doesn't provide legal counsel to associates, but I was able to refer her to legal services of Cleveland and tell her that they might be able to afford her representation at little or no cost in order to help resolve this dispute. And it was a great comfort to me to be able to let her know that that service existed for her, uh, to give her an opportunity to resolve this dispute. And without that, when you think about the circumstances, our associates come to work bringing all of the burdens of their lives with them and their ability to be who we want them to be in front of our customers and with each other depends on how, func uh, how the rest of their lives is working for them. And when they have disputes and when they have concerns, when they're being evicted, when they're having disputes with landlords, when they're running into consumer problems, we want them to have access to justice so that they can resolve those disputes as effectively as possible so they be who they want to be at work. Thank you, Teresa. John, again, you, you, you've been a, a, a champion and not only advocating on, on behalf of yourself and uh, HP, but also uh, getting hundreds of others to follow you. How, how do you do that? And, and why is it important to you and other business leaders access to justice? Well, again, great to be with all of you and great to be on a panel with Teresa and, and Ken and David. And no surprise, um, their answers, I think, covered most of, the, uh, of, of what I would have said, uh, and they've done so quite eloquently. Um, if I were to add one point, it would be that as a global company, you know, I've had the opportunity um, to um, evaluate and operate in uh, the business climates of more than 100 countries around the world. And in doing that, you very quickly recognize that some of the most defining aspects of whether that business climate is a good place to operate is tied to the quality of the legal system and whether it's stable, and most importantly, whether the citizens believe it's fair. And it doesn't just impact business disputes. It impacts, as Teresa was just describing, the everyday life of your employees, of your partners, of your customers. We have a real competitive advantage in this country, and it is called our legal system. And the fact that notwithstanding all of the challenges, and there are great ones. Most people in this country still believe the legal system is fair and it impacts so much of what we do. But that is not something we can take for granted. And we've seen some incredibly powerful examples in recent years that have challenged that view. Some of them are big, some of them are small, but as long as this justice gap exists, as long as large numbers of citizens cannot access an attorney to defend their rights or assert their rights, then we are at risk of losing that advantage. And to the point Ken made, seeing the fabric of our society torn in a way that would be very difficult to repair. Every business needs to care about that. Every person needs to care about it. That's why I care about it. That's why HPE cares about it. And that's why I continue to try to get as many general counsels and business leaders to support LSC funding and the efforts to close the justice gap. As we all know, there's a national conversation taking place, fortunately, I would say, and long yep. overdue, about access to justice and racial justice. 
I'd like to ask each of you for your thoughts on your roles in helping to shape that conversation and in helping to shape your company's involvement in promoting justice in America. David? Well, let me uh, just say that uh, what I've tried to do is modest compared to what everybody watching and uh, on this panel has done. But I have provided some support to enable the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, Civil Justice um, and Access to Justice Report to be, I'd say, more, more rigorously pursued. In other words, typically the American Academy of Arts and Sciences issues reports and then they either gather dust or maybe somebody reads them later on. What we're now trying to do with the American Academy of Arts and Sciences with this particular report in, in, uh, in focus is to hire people who can let people in Congress and Washington know what we've come up with and what they came up with, I should say, and, and try to do something about it as opposed to this issue it. So that's a modest contribution that I've tried to pursue. But let me just also add that in no country in the Western world or in any part of the world, really, is the legal system as important as it is in the United States. The rule of law is one of the greatest virtues we have in this country. And if you can't really participate in this legal system, then the great virtues of this country, to some extent, are not available to you. Um, and most recently, we observed this in the events uh, following the last election. There were, I think, 60 some lawsuits filed. And in every one of them, the judges decided that they were not appropriate and they were dismissed. And I think that just gave people a sense that the judges in this system, uh, in our system, really are, do believe in the rule of law and that we really um, uh, have a system that is so unique that no matter what political pressure is put on, the rule of law will prevail and the judges deserve a lot of credit. If you observe this from the outside and you say, I want to be in this system, I want to participate in a system where there's rule of law, but I don't have a lawyer, you are basically in on a, unable to really participate in what is our greatest, one of our greatest virtues, our rule of law. Thanks, David. Teresa? Well, I think that in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd, we had something of a, a wake up call for a number of corporations in America who stepped up to their responsibilities to ensure equal access to justice and say, what more can we do? A lot of that was turning inward for us at the Home Depot and looking at our diversity programs, looking at our inclusion programs and seeing what we could do to accelerate our efforts. And in particular, launching a series of caring conversations to deepen the conversations we were having with each other over issues of race and how race impacts the day-to-day -day lives of our uh, associates. And I think a lot of, of us learned uh, firsthand about the impact that the uh, criminal justice system has on some of our um, associates and how they experience and how those experiences differ across different um, racial groups. Um, we also doubled down our support for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights uh, to expand their very important work both in enforcing civil rights laws and also in election protection. Uh, we launched a get out the vote campaign to make sure all of our associates, wherever they were across the country, knew what they needed to do to register to vote, to put, participate in the political system, that they had the resources that they needed to vote and time off from work to be able to uh, vote and to cast their ballots. Uh, and we've continued our work by sponsoring, helping to support anti-hate crimes legislation in the states that um, didn't have it and also supporting second chance litigation legislation to allow people who have been exposed to the criminal justice system the opportunity to rejoin the world of work without uh, a criminal history following them um, around. We have more to do and we're looking forward to expanding our uh, participation on with and on behalf of our associates. Thanks, Teresa. John, what are your thoughts? Well, it's been interesting if you've been following sort of what's happening with corporations. Uh, I think it's uh, Edelman that did a study at the beginning of the year that showed that communications from the company and from the CEO are now the most trusted source of information for people, more so than the government, more so than media. The number one most trusted source right now is companies and the CEO. And that's not just for business information. It's basically for the 
information that is being put out to affect their lives. And so if that doesn't tell you that we have a special place or special role to play right now with respect to the challenges that have probably led to the results in the Edelman study, right? That, that, that I think we're, we're just not paying attention. I think for those of us who have a legal background and or are still in legal roles, the challenge and really the obligation, I believe, is to make sure that this no longer is seen as a legal problem handled by lawyers but it's an issue for the entire company from the chairman of the board, through the board of directors, to the CEO and throughout every part of the company. There's a lot of conversation today around ESG and that's an important conversation. But I think access to justice is still one of those areas that isn't getting the level of broad corporate attention that it deserves. I think the moment is right. I think our employees want to hear from us on these issues. And so for those of us in legal positions inside companies, we've got to find a way to continue to engage the rest of our organizations and the rest of the leadership. Because people want to hear that voice, we have the opportunity to speak. And I think if we do, we can uh, achieve what we've been trying to achieve for so long around closing the access, just, uh, the access gap. I think you're right. Uh, uh, John Levy likes to say there's a knowledge gap about the justice gap and uh, well corporate America can help fill that gap. Ken, 20 years ago, I don't recall, or when I was a kid, 50 years ago, I don't recall businesses being in the vanguard of the civil rights movement. Maybe I, I missed it, but uh, here you all are. Why, why is that? I think John said it very well. I think the public now expects a level of transparency and accountability of businesses that goes far beyond just the business of business, so to speak. You know, it used to be that many business people thought they could live in the shadows of these issues, uh, that they could be neutral. And by the way, I often quote Ellie Wiesel, who says that neutrality in the face of oppression is anything but neutrality. So let's remember that. Uh, just saying that I don't have a position, uh, being silent in the face of injustice could be viewed as acquiescence or even worse, complicity. So, but coming back to the point that I was making, I think that when there are issues in our society, and I've been involved recently with respect to voting rights issues, um, I've spoken to a lot of CEOs. Many of those CEOs say that doesn't really relate directly to my business. So now, of course, that's not true. Uh, for all the reasons we've stated, all of our business models depend on a stable functioning democracy. But it's also the case that our employees, our customers, and others will look to us to see what position, if any, we want to take on those issues. And again, I come back to what I was saying, uh, by taking no position on some of those issues, or at least not articulating a position, uh, many of our employees, particularly are being driven at Merck by our younger employees, they look to the company and they want to know that the company's values are aligned with theirs. And when we say that we care about things like diversity, equity, and inclusion, they expect us to show that not just with respect to what goes on within our four walls, but with respect to those issues writ large in our society. Thank you, Ken. The title of our panel uh, talks about the impact of the pandemic on access to justice and all of these issues. And obviously for lots of reasons, not just the title, but uh, the challenges that have been created, the unique challenges that have been created uh, by the pandemic uh, and the way the pandemic has exacerbated access to justice barriers and poverty and racial disparities across the country. Um, I'd like your thoughts on the pandemic's effect on access to justice, uh, particularly from the perspective of the business uh, community. Uh, Teresa? Well, I think it's been a bit of a double whammy. First, you have the pandemic and its very direct effects in terms of the opportunity to spread disease. And you think about access to healthcare and how that's been impaired, not with just with respect to people who have uh, COVID or are in danger of contracting COVID, but also with respect to their access to healthcare for other issues uh, and challenging chronic health needs um, that are not being addressed at the same rate at the same time. 
And we know that there was a disparate impact of the disease on Hispanic communities, on low-income communities, on African-American communities. And we don't know yet how much of that was lack of information uh, and access to the technology to have access to the same information and, and how much was disinformation being spread in those communities that kept them from being able to protect themselves the way that other communities might. And we know that as courts have protected themselves uh, in the face of COVID, that it's been harder for people to interact with the justice system to have cases resolved. And we know how important technology has become to every level of functioning in our society from having kids get requisite levels of education to access to court, to being able to move cases along. And COVID has exacerbated all of that. And then the double part of the whammy is that the government has tried to respond. You know, there are multiple benefits have been enacted through the CARES Act and other vehicles. But in order to access those benefits, you have to have access to someone who can help you to access those benefits, to know when mistakes are made or know, know how to get to them. And that in itself requires some level of access to information and technology, the very things that the bills are trying to counteract the lack of. So that's why legal services become so important in having those bills reach their intended targets. Uh, and as you said at the end of the last panel, uh, they can't be effective without organizations like the legal aid societies and the, and the entities that LSC funds and getting those, that relief to the people who are its intended targets. Well, I, you know, I think that's, that is a powerful point. Uh, a lot of people think that the eviction moratorium, for example, is self-enforcing and uh, all evictions are on hold. Well, that's not the case. Uh, they have gone forward in, in enormous volumes and typically uh, courts are reliant on uh, the tenant to raise the uh, defense. And many people are not even aware of the moratorium and uh, can't raise it effectively without access to a, to a, a lawyer. Uh, John, what, what are your thoughts uh, you've been an advocate in this uh, arena for a long time. What, what are your thoughts on the effect of the pandemic? What we've seen uh, outside of the legal space is that the pandemic, um, with some exceptions, hasn't fundamentally changed trends. It has simply accelerated trends with respect to the digital world. So the work from home, this trend was already happening, but what we've seen in the pandemic obviously is a, a absolutely uh, acceleration of it, e-commerce, et cetera. I don't think we've seen that same acceleration of the trends from a technology perspective with respect to the legal system. And that's a concern because technology is a, uh, a, a can play a large role in closing the access gap. So I think if we take to the, uh, the technology trends that we're seeing everywhere else, and we really do embrace them, and there are certainly good things underway, but I don't think we have fully embraced them in the way other industries have. I think we can use the pandemic to accelerate the trend that will close the justice gap. Some of it is doing things like this. Some of it is the ancillary items. Do we require barred attorneys in one state to represent these clients when now through the power of Zoom, someone sitting anywhere else in the United States could be servicing a client somewhere else in the United States? And are we going to allow these rules to continue to be barriers? Are we going to insist that in all these instances, barred attorneys are the ones doing the work themselves? We've seen some um, work in Washington. We've seen some work in Utah to try to create um, a set of capabilities that would expand the number of providers. So I think there's some technology pieces. I think there are some barriers that we've erected as a profession over time that we need to take a fresh look at. And so I think the pandemic has in a positive way, to the extent there are any positives about it, accelerated trends and disruption and caused us to rethink certain things. I think we need to do the same thing in the legal side in order to really uh, move forward in a way that can bring um, much more, uh, you know, supply into the uh, into the uh, into the system and, and close the uh, the justice gap. I think the opportunity is there. We just have to lead on it. A frequent guest at LSC events is Bridget McCormick, the Chief Justice of the 
Michigan Supreme Court, and she has said on several occasions, the pandemic was not a crisis we wanted, but is probably the crisis that access to justice needed. And uh, I think there's a lot of truth in that. Ken, what's your take on the effect of the pandemic on, on justice and uh, uh, these various uh, disparities that you know were always existent, but have now become aggravated? Well, I won't repeat some of the comments that have been already made. It's, you know, the, you know, America had a lot of poor people who were disadvantaged. Uh, the pandemic has, has not affected everybody in this country equally. It has affected some people much more. We see it in terms of the rate of deaths in certain communities, uh, the rate of evictions in certain communities. So that to me is obvious. What, what I actually think the pandemic has done is it has revealed what I think is very important for us as Americans to realize is that we're living in a time when many of our fellow citizens have now come to believe that America is not a place of unlimited opportunity. They don't believe that their children will be better off than they necessarily were. And I think we have to worry if we're in a system where people believe that they live in a world of constrained resource and opportunity. Uh, because as long as they believe that, it becomes a zero sum game. One group gains at the expense of another, and we can see that in some of the political discourse that's going on inside our country right now. So I think as business leaders, one of the things we have to be focused on is how do we create more opportunity, whether it's educational opportunity or whether it's joblessness that we're addressing, uh, because I want to believe, maybe I'm an optimist, but I want to believe that there's enough reason and resources in our country to reach our highest aims as Americans. And one of those highest aims is equal justice for all. So it's a question of us not living in a world where we think we have such scarce resources that one group gets taken care of and another doesn't get taken care of. And that's exactly the issue in the justice system. Those who can afford a lawyer actually get the benefits of the system that David so eloquently described as being our chief virtue. Those who don't have no access. And I think as businesses, we wanna worry about a situation where our fellow citizens do think that we live in a world of really constrained resources and rights. I could comment on this subject. Um, we will debate for many years whether or not the virus was caused by the Wuhan laboratory or some natural cause. But if the Wuhan laboratory had said, how can I hurt the most poor people in the United States the most effective way and increase their uh, inability to get access to justice, they couldn't have come up with a better system. And for, for three reasons, that's the case. Number one, the wealthy people in the United States have gotten wealthier, far wealthier than they ever were before. It's staggering the amount of wealth that's been created during this pandemic by for the wealthy people, the technology people, people in the financial service world. That has served two purposes or two effect, has had two effects. One is it has isolated the wealthy people further from the people that aren't so wealthy because they are sitting in their homes they're sitting in their bunkers, they're isolated, they're just making more money, and they're not, as, they're not seeing the people anymore that are the uh, embodiment of the problem. Secondly, the people that have been hurt by this, the people of the under e economic underclass, they are worried about survival. They're worried about getting food for their family, clothing their family, paying the rent. They are not focused on what they can do better to deal with the legal system because they've been so focused on, on issues of survival. And so I think that this pandemic could not have done more to hurt the gap between the wealthy and the, and the non-wealthy, but also the, the lack of uh, a focus on the legal system. For example, wealthy people today, they don't see very many people who aren't wealthy because they're isolated and they're not really sensitive as much as they may have been before to the problems that people who are in the underclass are, are now engaging in even worth. So I think it's been a terrible thing. And, and I think it's going to take many years to fix this problem. This isn't going to be solved when everybody's been vaccinated. We're, we're going to be living with the problems of the pandemic for many, many years. Let me uh, uh, ask a final question and ask each of you to, uh, to, to, to help us think about it. Um, you obviously are, are, are leaders on these issues and leaders in communicating on these issues. And I'd like your thoughts on you know, what we can do collectively to better communicate with other business uh, people about the legal needs of the poor and how, how can the business community uh, 
uh, you know, better communicate with uh, decision makers in advancing this cause. Um, I, I think I said it bef before at the outset of the panel, people expect the chairman of the board of LSC to uh, uh, lobby for more funds for LSC. People expect the president of LSC uh, to lobby for more funds for civil legal aid. People don't expect uh, uh, the uh, CEO and chair of Merck uh, to show up at, at their door to talk about these issues. And it has a big impact as a result when that happens. So let's, if, if you could think, help us think strategically and tactically about how to go forward from this moment. And uh, John, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I think uh, as we discussed, the opportunity is there to um, engage beyond the legal side of the, of the corporate world and to get to the CEOs and the boards. Right now, ESG is an incredibly hot topic because of everything from you know, Larry Fink's letters to you know, other efforts, but it still tends to exclude directly access to justice. I think we have to find a way to change that. We need people to be thinking about access to justice in the same way they think about climate sustainability or they talk about race equity. It is integral to what we're trying to do. And I think if we don't change that narrative, if we don't get it out of the legal stream into the mainstream of business, then we won't succeed and we will miss the window of opportunity. Obviously that's easier said than done, but I think we've got to find a way both through investors, through our boards, et cetera, to change the, the discussion so that access to justice is viewed in the same way as those other issues. Can I just add to that, um, if, if I could now? Yes, uh, please. The word lawyers are not beloved by most pe people who are not lawyers. Uh, remember what Shakespeare said about them. And um, of course, Shakespeare never really uh, needed a lawyer, probably. Had he needed a lawyer, he wouldn't have said that, but uh, <laughs> because he would have wanted access to justice to have a lawyer. But but the truth is, when you talk about lawyers and legal access and access to justice, to some extent, it rolls off uh, the backs of people. You have to make this a human rights issue. This is human rights. And so when the United States complains about human rights in China or other parts of the country, it gets the attention of business people because nobody wants to be on the wrong side of human rights. But when you say it's a legal access issue, it tends to have my eyes glaze over a kind of effect. So I would urge business people to talk about this as a human rights issue and the Legal Services Corporation to talk more about it as a human rights issue and not a lawyer legal issue. That would be my recommendation. Thank you. David, just real quick, I couldn't agree with you more. And a few years ago, we started to try to talk about this in the same way we talk about the right to health care as a human right, the right to legal counsel as, as a human right. I, I could not agree with you more. Um, I think that is absolutely the right way to talk about it and think about it. Yeah, it's not about lawyers. It's about housing. It's about health care. It's about uh, jobs, uh, subsistence, safety. Um, Teresa? You just said what I was going to be about to say. You know, the, one of the questions about what should business love about poverty in America, it's tremendously expensive for all of us to be poor in America. It's expensive to get education and education support. It's expensive to maintain housing. It's expensive to maintain transportation. It's extensive, expensive to stay out of the grasp of landlords and, and payday lenders and others who thrive on the fact that they deal with clients and customers who don't have the wherewithal to fight back. Uh, businesses that don't give people their last paychecks, people, businesses that don't make employees aware of the benefits that they're entitled to have uh, by law and hope they won't take advantage of, of those benefits. And the thing that we need to know is that that makes life difficult, not just for the poor who are the direct victims, but all of us are indirect victims when the people in our communities and society are victimized in that way. And lawyers, or what often stand between victims and those who would victimize them. And it's one of the privileges of our profession to stand in the way in that path 
and to make sure everybody has access to someone to stand in that path for them makes them stronger and enriches all of us in, in turn. Ken, you get the, the last word. Okay, well, I'll go with where I started, which is access to justice is fundamental to a healthy functioning democracy. And a healthy functioning democracy is fundamental to business. I don't expect my fellow CEOs to be as rabidly pro-democratic as Thomas Paine was, but I expect them to understand that if we live in a society where too many of our fellow citizens no longer feel that they're getting a fair shake from the justice system, from our economy, from our educational system, so forth and so on, then in the long run, we are gonna miss the level of unity and stability and respect and support for our system of government, including the rule of law that we all depend on uh, to run our businesses. I wanna thank uh, Ken and Teresa and John and David for an extraordinary conversation. Uh, I wanna thank them for their leadership. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, as David uh, said at the outset, my guess is you can all uh, count on hearing from John again, sometime, that is John Levy, sometime <laughs> soon. So I'll look forward to uh, seeing you on that occasion. Thanks to all of you.